Max Griffiths is handling head of uh, platform engineering team in Europe in Totworks, right? So it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you. And uh, Dalibor uh, Kovacevic, uh, chief of chief information. Uh, I almost said that you are uh, CEO of Rifleson, but that would be uh, okay, right? That's okay. That's okay. I wouldn't <laughs> mind. <laughs> uh, our one of our biggest clients, and we are always very grateful to have you here uh, with us. You already met. Sasha and Kresha. Uh, luckily, you met Sasha, so I don't need to pronounce the last name, <laughs> which would be. And hard. Sasha's fine. <laughs> Sasha's fine. So, uh, Max, I think you have been working uh, in fields of platform engineering for so many years, and since we will try to assume that not all the people in the room uh, have the same level of knowledge. So please explain to me how they say, as I'm three years old, <laughs> uh, what is platform engineering? What is platform engineering? Well, I'm going to try and not spoil some of, the, some of the bits of my talk that's tomorrow. So if you want a, a bit more of a deeper dive into kind of the, the origins of platform engineering, definitely come and have a look at that. But I think, um, you know, DevOps is still very much around and I think if you start with DevOps and look around the cultural things that Sasha was looking into, um, the rise of cloud, I think, is, is sort of one of the major reasons, I think, for platform engineering. And I think it's because um, if you look at what the cloud providers were producing about 10 years ago, you know, you could get some like let's say AWS is one of the major cloud providers. You could get some infrastructure around compute, you could get some databases, maybe you could get S3, you know, sort of file system, an API driven file system. So maybe like a handful of things that developers could go into and they could kind of get to grips with and piece together some pretty basic infrastructure that you could deploy some, some applications on. And you know, maybe you've got a production system there where you can go out and make money via a shop front or something like that. And I think if you, if you look at that page that you get when you go into AWS, these, these things that are available 10 years ago, it was pretty approachable to, to, to an, an average developer, right? You didn't need to know about like loads of intricacies of like a Linux operating system, or you didn't need to know how to cable all of these computers together in a complex way. As a developer, you understood APIs and you understood a GUI and you could go in there and you could pick and plug, so, or plug and play. If you fast forward to, to now, if you go into those same interfaces for all of the, the revamps that they've done over the years, you've got hundreds and hundreds of things that you can compose together now. And so I think what's happened with the cloud providers is that they've done a great job, they've scaled massively, you can now do like these amazing things across every single sort of technical discipline you know, whether that's data, whether it's machine learning, whether it's AI, whether it's, um, you know, Kubernetes, whatever it might be, you can go there, you can find something. But what it's done is created a hugely complex space where now your average developer goes into that and just goes, you know, like, what, what am I going to do here? And I think at the same time in parallel, you've also had a lot of, there's a humanistic element to this as well. You've got a lot of data center engineers that have been used to racking and stacking, and now we've moved to the cloud. So now a lot of those people have said, oh, now I need to learn Terraform or infrastructure as code, right? So you've got these large enterprises that have got these bodies of people that are very technical and they really understand some of the fundamentals of infrastructure and, 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 and now they're starting to make that journey across the cloud and understanding how to do things in more a cloud native way. But you've got a whole body of people there as well who have important skills, who know how to kind of connect stuff and solve some of these problems. And I think that's where platform engineering has now come in. One is that there's a, there's a huge amount of complexity that needs to be abstracted and presented to the developer organization so that they can continue to go fast. And we can have an argument about you know, how much uh, full stack a developer needs to be and how much um, flexibility and capability they should have, should they have access to, a, to an AWS console. Um, we can have that discussion and, and the answer is there isn't really a clear answer. So you, you need to understand for, for, for all of those cases. But I think it, we can agree that it's very complex and if you have a team of people who are there trying to simplify that for certain teams and to create a set of self-service components um, that enable developers to go fast and, and, and go fast securely, um, then that's a really powerful thing. And I think, 
I'll just say one more thing is that I think when, when DevOps was kind of going through its maturity, I think that this idea of a DevOps team sort of became an anti-pattern. And I'm not talking about one that Sasha went through, which is like, you know, an enablement team, a capability building team, but this kind of one-stop shop where if you're not coding Java, you, this is the team that's going to solve every problem. Release management, testing, you know, everything. And that, that, that is an anti-pattern. And I think it's easy to say, well, isn't a platform team just that? And I think there's a few words that you can use to, to ensure that you're on the right track, and that's around self-service, and it's around thinking about your developers as customers of those services. And I think if you can keep some of those simple concepts in mind, then it's likely you're doing good platform engineering. Okay. Thanks. So um, I think it seems that we have been uh, really good in making our lives more complex and harder in the last 20 years. I think it's fair to say. Obviously, there is a tremendous influence of us wanting to be more scalable to our clients and cloud, as you said. But uh, it's, at this moment, uh, we are almost like contemporary musician, like Sarah said yesterday. We are uh, uncomprehensive even to ourselves. And so we need like uh, introductions to the panels to explain people what we want to talk about. So, uh, Kresha, what was your journey? I know that you have been in the last maybe six or seven years preaching platform engineering, and I think you were changing your story and the way how you want to explain it. So, what's your experience in 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 in, in that? Uh, not with the platform engineering itself, but in explaining it to yeah. to the people. Yeah. So the 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 thing that kind of hooked me into into the whole story, like six or seven years ago, was this idea of uh, bringing the product mindset and product thinking into the whole platform engineering story. So uh, it, it seems kind of logical and natural to think about technology in that way, because if you are a big organization, then you probably have like tens or, or even hundreds of uh, product teams who are building value for for the clients, and this is perfectly normal. But if you try to apply the same uh, product approach to, to how you handle technology in your IT landscape, then it used to be uh, somewhat problematic. So that was the first thing that kind of hooked me into the whole story. And we started talking to, to several clients about, OK, let's try to see what this product really is. That That's typically a first hurdle that you stumble upon when you try to introduce this this concept because uh, with again business products it's a lot easier you you have customers who are real people real, with real needs but with technology is it's a bit more difficult to to define uh, th this concept of value so that's a good part of the story Se second concept that uh, that was also uh, important for me was this notion of, of making things simpler for for developers, which in turn easily translates again to business value, because out of those tens or, or hundreds of development teams in your organization, if you make developers' lives easier by automating things, by procuring in a way tool chains and, and how they do their daily work, you, you make them more efficient, and uh, again, this easily translates into into business value for for the clients in those in those kinds of organizations. Uh, so, yeah, th that's what got me started with uh, the story. Uh, Dalibor, your journey is like every other journey, full of <laughs> roads that are under construction. I would say so. Uh, which, what kind of problems you were facing when you? realized you need platform engineering to to bridge those problems yeah so uh, i would shortly go back to the plat question what actually is a platform and um, i would say uh, it's chat gpt before chat gpt and not in the literal way but when you ask people what is a platform you get a different answer every yeah. time yeah. so it's like so it's hallucinating chat, yeah it's hallucinating <laughs> it's a hallucination yeah yeah but um, Yes, growing, um, growing the digital, uh, digital products and becoming a digital leader requires a lot of technology. And if you have a lot of technology, then we 
come to the to the basic basic point that uh, there is 20, 50, 100 different technologies in the organization, which people need to use, need to know how to use. They need to um, work with it in a daily life. So, and everything to serve the customer. And if we are not efficient in that way, then we are not doing doing a good job. And when you are starting, and when that's only 10 technologies, then it's fine. But when you're growing the teams, growing the landscape, then you come to a, to a threshold where you cannot scale anymore uh, with um, such a vari variety of technologies in-house. So you need to put it on, on one place. And that was kind of uh, one of the drivers that uh, was pushing us to a, to a platform. The second one is also mentioned before, the developer experience. Uh, also, as you get more mature, at the start, everyone is doing it uh, intensively. Everyone is really hyped about new stuff, new technology. We are bringing up new apps, new internet banking, everything. And you don't need that kind of, uh, I would say, platform that drives you, uh, for, the de for the developers to be motivated to drive you forward. But at one point of time, we get to a level, OK, now the hype is over, and we need to start working properly. And working properly means putting things on the same, uh, what's it called in English, nazivnik? <laughs> uh, same, uh, uh, yeah, same yeah. plane. Let's, let's uh, tell it like that. And common de de <laughs> common de denominator. denominator. It's a my, uh, I'm a mathematician. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But you need. Yeah. So, and then mm -hmm. the platform and the platform team helps you helps you do that. Okay. I will ask you afterwards how is it really going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for now, while well, we are still in this uh, early stages of selecting if we want to go to the playground, so Sasha, you you mentioned a couple of time uh, times uh, play in your organization. Uh, and I was thinking while I was uh, listening to your session to your um, presentation about is. Can we maybe uh, co compare a uh, platform with playground in terms of some, there is some sort of fence, there are some sort of rules of engagement, there are some tools. Is it fair to compare it? Yeah, I mean, th that talks to my German part of no, rules, regulations. You see that <laughs> my German part is becoming <laughs> yeah, yeah, stronger. Yeah, very good. You see, guys? <laughs> but yeah, you're right. I mean, wh the, what, what you already all talked about uh, of why we need platforms, the cognitive load and, and, and getting everyone on the same page, no, common denominator, um, that all makes sense. But again, I think platforms also help you in, in yeah, sticking to rules and regulations and making it easier to use those rules and regulations because sort of, you, you sometimes need on a playground with small kids. You need someone to say, "Okay, stop beating the other guy with the shovel." Yeah, um, and that makes <laughs> sense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Please laughs> not, <laughs> not don't take, don't use the tool. Yeah, just use yeah. your hand. No, but you, you need this from time to time. So you need some sort of rules and regulations. On the other hand, you just need you need to make sure that it's just a light touch. Yeah, it's not not too much so that everyone is afraid and no one wants to play. Um, so yeah, you have to find find the middle way. But I think. Um, yeah, it makes sense to have this this platform as a central piece to where you can then put the regulations in. Yeah. And I'm absolutely sure it's not the same to introduce anything or any change into a smaller organization, I don't know, product-focused organization compared to the large organizations like banks and telecoms. So, Max, I hope, I hope I'm sure you've seen a lot of problems when it comes to really implementing platform engineering in uh, bigger organizations. So what would you say? Is there a chance at all? <laughs> well, I, I, I actually really wanted to tag on to the play because I was yeah, thinking okay. there about, you know, when you think about the number of um, like cool things that, that uh, cloud providers, as I, I was using as, as an example, are bringing out. Like you want developers to, to run towards that. Most developers are saying, like, I want to use that latest thing. And we're in danger as kind of platform engineering to say, you know, it's not ready yet, or you know, we're, we're figuring out how to integrate that. Um, but I, I think it's a good challenge uh, to, to try and create that playful environment because that is where innovation, that's where experimentation comes, and they can developers can likely go faster into some of those things than than you might be because you need to think about, you know, security and governance. But 
if you were to create like a, like a playground environment, right? I've worked in companies where the environment is actually called playground environment. It, it can quite quickly become not fun because although it's a playground environment, you need to make sure that people aren't pushing things out onto the open internet or opening up ports such that people can come in and you know, take your intellectual property. So you start thinking about, okay, we need to be a little bit less fun because we need to kind of do these things. And, and then the, 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 the struggle is, is that you'll have developers create amazing things and then the first thing they say is they, they go, right, we're ready to push it to a sort of you know, QA environment or, or pre-production. And then you say, well, okay, well, have you, have you automated it? Have you got your pipelines ready for this? Have you got your tests? Oh, no, uh, yeah, we need to go and do that. And then suddenly you're trying to wire this playground environment into the rest of your infrastructure, which isn't really what it was intended to. So there are challenges there, right? There, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of opportunity, but I think there are definitely um, challenges to, to create that. And I think your question was then about scaling into, <laughs> no, no. Lar into large Is there a chance that in a, in a big organization, in a corporation, where there are really a lot of struggle when it comes to change and adopting something new, how to approach to platform engineering? Because it sounds, as we, as we already talked, it, we are trying to uh, take something that's very complex into something a little bit simpler by using very complex, let's be honest, concepts. You hit the complex organization, so yeah. how so to I, do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Easy I, I, question, you so, know. Well, it, it is, because I've done it the wrong way, and, 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 and I, I like to think I've done it a better way, maybe okay. not the right way. So I, I was working for a large bank, and this was back in you know, a few years ago now, so it was more about uh, sort of Puppet and Chef, which are a kind of infrastructure automation tool suites, than that was when DevOps was really booming. Um, and you know, we were building automated infrastructure. It was on-premise at the time, but we were almost building our own kind of cloud because banks were really against the cloud providers, you know, 10 years ago, so it's difficult. And we built a whole bunch of stuff which we thought was awesome, you know. It used to take six months to procure hardware and put in the data center and get it all up to scratch and then hand it over to developers. It was, it was great and everybody felt really happy, but the 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 way that developers then needed to interface with this sort of system that we'd built is they had to learn Chef. And Chef, if you know, is based on Ruby. Ruby is a language that, that not Java developers aren't gonna have fun with. And so, but we thought it was great. We were like, you're gonna be able to control your own infrastructure. This is brilliant. You just need to learn Chef. And then here's a bunch of code that you need to learn how it works and pull it all together. And then you can spin up your applications on servers. It did not go well because in a bank, we had sort of 5,000 developers across multiple locations, uh, some, some in the US, some in, some in India, and they were used to coming in to their jobs and coding Java all day long and committing it, hopefully, to version control, um, and, and that's true, like, it wasn't all going into version control, um, which is now kind of commonplace for us, thank, thank the Lord. Um, and then they would commit Java code, and then they would go home and they'd be like, my job's done. I'm a Java developer, I've coded some Java, uh, I think it works. They wouldn't even know which environment it goes into next. So when I then went there and said, look, we've got this amazing tool, you can go and do it, they, they were not interested at all. So my reflection on that is, again, it comes back to product, it comes back to people thinking about the customer, uh, developers as customer, which actually was only a realization I went through about five years ago. And then I realized actually 15 years I'd been actually working as developers being my customer, but I hadn't used that language. Um, unfortunately, I'd had enough guidance along the line, so I was, all, I was already kind of behaving like that, but it, it, it helps so much to talk to people like, like you folks here today about that. So now, just to kind of summarize it, it's thinking about that interface between this, this complexity and the people that are using it. And the other thing is that it's not one size fits all. In a large organization, you're gonna have those people that just wanna do Java all day long. That isn't a bad thing. It is important that they understand uh, what happens to their code and, and how it behaves differently in different environments. I, I think that is really important. But I'm not asking a, a, Java, a Java developer to be an excellent database uh, uh, developer or data expert. I'm not asking them to be an infrastructure expert or like learn about Kubernetes, only if it helps them be better developers. But then there are those developer teams who want more flexibility. They want access to those AWS APIs as soon as they come out. And so when you're thinking as a platform engineering team about those customers, it's not one customer, it's different customers. And you have to figure out, well, how am I going to change the way that my services present to them based on what they need to do? And that, that's quite complex, and it's, quite, it's a level of maturity that you need to go through as well.
So, so that's a very impor important take that developer is being your client, which is maybe easier for us who come from the services organization and might be a little bit harder for the guys who work in the same company <laughs> with this customer. Is that kind of approach something that works for you in a large organization as I well? Mean, that, that's what we tried to drive home. Uh, the, but, but, Deutsche Telekom IT, yeah, d d separate from the business, we, we've always had problems with seeing what is our customer. Yeah? Uh, so even the end customers, the ones who are in the shops and buy the phones and, and whatever. Um, so uh, we, we needed to get this whole customer-centric thing into Tel-IT anyway. Yeah? Um, and even more so in the CICD hub or in the, the, the platform teams so that they understand, okay, what are your internal customers? Yeah, and when I, when I talk to hubs, one of the first questions I usually ask is, okay, first First of all, show me your value stream, mostly a mess because they don't know their value stream. And then I say, okay, but, but who's your customer? And then often I also get blank stares at that question as well, um, which is not a good sign. Yeah, everyone should know what they're working towards. Um, and in the internal developer teams and, and the, the platform teams, uh, they need to make sure that they clearly understand how can I make the life of the developers better yeah, and not just implement something because it, 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 it it's fancy or because that all, all the other... I'd, I'd prefer having stuff which is fancy because that usually means someone's enthusiastic about something and wants to try something out. Yeah, but sometimes it's just not. Now we we can't give them that. One one nice example is we have um, what we call a cloud center of excellence, uh, which helps us in onboarding the developers onto the cloud, uh, to AWS, Google, Azure, and so on. Um, and they have uh, sandboxes. Uh, and in the beginning, the sandbox just had a two or three services, not, not two or three, but a three or four maybe, three or four of those AWS services. All the others were blocked. Um, so you could really only just set up an EC2 machine, add some S3 storage to it, and, and basically run a virtual server in the cloud. Yeah, uh, And all the other fancy services were, you couldn't use them, like Lambda and so on. But then how do you get into innovation? How do you then get those teams to, to think about, we're not gonna do lift and shift and just move our workload from the T-System service where they're running on, on VMs, put them into the cloud, but how do we really leverage the cloud and, and use um, Lambda functions or whatever services they are to really qu work uh, effic more efficiently, cost efficient, faster, and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's highly important that the developers uh, of internal platforms know exactly what their customers want and what, what the goal is, sort of, because you know? it's, it's not just this is just you know, now your virtual machine, you know, use it, but more of, okay, this is the, the sandbox, try, try everything out because we want innovation. Yeah. The, ter the, the, the term sandbox as well, I think we, we use so like commonly now, but again, it goes back to playground. It was in yeah. originally yeah, invented absolutely. that safe absolutely. space, you know. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, great, great. Uh, we mentioned sandbox yesterday in some, or even a day before when we met here about how uh, we, even before realizing how play and playground is important, we kind of use the words. So it was always somewhere here. So we just need to start acting on it. And uh, how, is, how is it really going now for, for Rifus and Bank in terms of platform engineering? Uh, I would say we are uh, maturing. So we are going into a, into a different phase. We, for a couple of years, we had one platform, it was on-prem, it was designed for, uh, uh, to kickstart even our innovation cycle and dig digitalization. Um, it went as well as it could have gotten at, at that period of time. So uh, I think we started like 2018 and uh, building a platform in that time and building it now is total, total different, um, different story, yeah. Uh, but now we are on a maturity level that we can, um, we are not starting from the scratch again. So we now know what do we need to do, what challenges we are facing, and what uh, we don't want to. You already know uh, what's not to repeat. Yeah, what not to repeat. <laughs> we all know industry, not only <laughs> yeah. you, I would say. But um, yes, it it should be a playground. Also, yeah, we need to we need to have uh, we need to have. Uh, something that motivates the people, uh, the engineers, to try new things and to to experiment, but also experimenting, especially on cloud. And our new platform is uh, on cloud, uh, can be expensive. So th this is something that we need to we need to keep keep under under control. Also, also there is a lot of um, in a company every change, not even in not, not just in Germany, every change has has resistance. So. Uh, 
not recently there there was uh, also th this kind of South Park situation. Like if you are watching South Park, it's they took our jobs. So will the platform take our our job? Uh, no, you just need to streamline it, streamline it properly, and you need, and you need to change. But that's also for for the ops guys. That's a strong message. You will need to change because. Uh, the environment, let's call it again, the playground is changing, and we are now we now have new toys, and the new toys are designed to help uh, the customer. And a lot of ops guys in in the previous days, they didn't even know or want to know the internal customer, let alone the external, the, the, the real one, the real, <laughs> the real one. Now we are building it, so we are building the platform team that everyone in the platform team firstly knows the external customers and knows the product that they uh, are contributing to. Value, so, real yeah, value. The real yeah. value and the product. And if I'm building, uh, let's say, if I'm building a mobile app, then maybe there is one set of technologies that the team I'm helping needs, the developers needs. If I'm building something that uh, requires a lot of data, a lot of streaming, real-time integration, real-time decision-making, then maybe it's another set, set of technologies. And without being that uh, expert function that the developers go, uh, go to and can lean on to have the proper tools given to them, then it cannot, it cannot be the, the proper way, way forward. So th this is kind of the way that we are, we are starting the, the new platform. You already mentioned the, that uh, you are now very much focusing on the value to the end client. Does it mean that business is now included uh, more in, uh, in this platform concept and uh, building the platform or, how, or is it uh, the next not, stage? Or That's yeah. a question from the, from the audience. So not into building the platform, but uh, all our digital products are done in agile teams and the business is a core uh, element of the team, so core team member of the teams and they are driving our agile team, so which, which means the stakeholders from uh, business, the business owner from the, those product teams will also be stakeholders in the platform team. So now we are in the last few days we are even considering uh, the platform team is from uh, ownership perspective owned uh, by IT. Now we are uh, considering pulling in business owners to be co-owners of the, of, of the platform to achieve that first step and that... Uh, and understanding and focusing yeah, on and the right thing. On and the when it comes, goals. now I will ask Sasha, but that's, even, that's in fact a question for the people from the multi-geographical uh, multi organizations. So is, it, is there one platform fit all the countries or do you <laughs> like... It, that's, that's a good question. So we, we, I think it depends. Yeah, uh, and you need some, some flexibility, but I mean, one of the things we're doing is uh, what we, we have what we call one app, uh, which is uh, in, in Germany, it's called Mein Magenta, the app, uh, where you can see um, all the, the data usage you've had on your, on your contracts. You can, there's Magenta moments in there where you can get uh, access to, to tickets and, and, and win stuff and so on. Um, and you can see your last bill and everything. Uh, and we have rolled that out over uh, several European countries. So in all the nine, I think nine countries, we, we are at, at Deutsche Telekom uh, as a teleco provider. Uh, I think not in all, it's, it's been launched yet, but we're working on making that more and more uh, overall. But you always need to make sure that then it's not just one thing because it will not work if you if you do this centrally and say okay this is for this is whole it. Europe it's not going to work and then the the, the um, one app we now launched in in the U.S. Uh, at the last Super Bowl it was launched uh, with a commercial and everything they they share the same code base but again it's highly specialized to their market because it's it's a, just a different market um, so I would say you need this, this trade-off of having central components which you can sort of use as building blocks, but you need enough wiggle room that you can put in specific blocks in between there. Yeah. It seems that nothing that we do can be simple and fits all, no. but it's always <laughs> like, <laughs> it depends. One size never fits But yeah. uh, Kresho, so um, there is always this approach like, Big Bang or uh, saying very loud that we are doing platform team and of course it's very important that we are being transparent and tell people what we are doing but maybe there is a other way 
to go and maybe at least try. Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I would always vote, just as we talked about uh, here, I would always vote for the organizational transformation, specifically with, with this concept of platform engineering, you know, doing it transparently from a top-down kind of initiative. But sometimes there, there can be uh, maybe more organic way from the inside out. Uh, we had recently uh, one experience of, of that kind, where we worked with a customer with whom we started a, a project team. We were building a product together with this uh, customer. And it started as a small, rather small initiative, a couple of people in the team, and then it grew over time. Nobody mentioned platform engineering at, at any point. We were just talking about features, about market, the usual stuff. But at some point, as the team grew towards I don't know, 20 people, uh, it started to become apparent that there are some topics in this team which are not related directly to, to features and functions of the product, but instead some common concerns which apply to, to the infrastructure, the concerns like security, like governance, automation, and so on. And we said, okay, let, let's do a little organizational change within this team. Let's split the team into a group of people who will be tasked to take care about these overarching concerns. And the rest of the people will continue building uh, features of the product using the things that the, the platform group created as a, as a capability in this platform. In, in this way, we basically created a new experience in, in this collaboration, showing that this concept is really working okay within smaller context, but it gave us a chance to talk about applying this concept in, in a broader areas of, of this particular organization. So it may not be the, the easier way, and as I said in the beginning, I would always vote for a Main prepared, door, organized... Yeah, yeah, as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Max, there is one uh, direct question for you. What impact does the developer portal as a marketplace have on development value streams? How much bang for the buck can leadership expect if done correctly? Yeah, really good question. Yeah. Um, I did just want to uh, add on to the, to the last question, actually, because it, was, it made me think of a, another. I, I gave the story about the large enterprise, and actually, we had an opportunity. Typically, I work with always with clients. I'm a consultant, so we're usually on client sites and doing that. There was one opportunity where the client didn't really have an IT team, so we got to work with all thought workers. So we were like, great. All ThoughtWorks people were going to do this the right way, the best way, and exactly the same pattern emerged. We started with one team, we had about eight engineers, and we were doing front-end and back-end and infrastructure services, and the co this is another sort of uh, testament to Conway's law, um, where the team, because it was one, all of the GitHub repos were a little bit all over the place, the infrastructure stuff was in the app repo, and it was only a matter of time before some people just started working more on the kind of devops -y type stuff, thinking about path to prod, thinking about some monitoring and observability. Other people were kind of shifting a little bit that way. And the, these lines of these delineation lines just kind of started to form quite naturally. And I think if any of you have seen like Sam's book on, on building microservices, it's exactly the same pattern there. Start, if you don't know like the rates of change in your software, if you don't know how, how it's going to evolve, start with a big system, dare I say, a monolith, and then start to look for these lines of uh, separation and, 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 and then start to split um, again with your software architecture and with, uh, with your teams as well. Are you going to mention domain-driven design right now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You D can play this game. D D D yeah, <laughs> DDD, D huh? domain-driven design plays massively in platform engineering as well, but pro probably for another time. To go back to the question about dev yeah. portals, so so developer portals are the uh, I, I would say the current hotness. Like I, I'm seeing a lot of. Um, customers um, in, in all different industries coming to us saying, you know, we've got Spotify backstage or we've got a dev portal. Um, one of the challenges, and so I think the question was about, am I getting bang for my buck? Well, again, like return on investment is a big question across all of IT, um, and there's different ways that you can start to try to measure that, whether it's measuring productivity, et cetera, et cetera. Dev portals, um, it, like, to me, dev portals, they haven't always been around, and we've been able to do great platform engineering, great DevOps, great software delivery without them. Um, so 
I, I think you need to be careful with dev portals as being the next, um, the, the, the next great tool that you need to bring into your ecosystem. Um, you know, something like Spotify Backstage is an incredibly powerful, I mean, it is not a tool in and of itself, it's a framework, so that's the first thing that, that people quite often make the mistake. It's highly customizable. There are other uh, tools out there that are a bit more out of the box, like Port. Um, and so the, 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 what they can do for your organization is very powerful, but again, I, it, I don't want to reduce them by calling them frosting on a cake, but it's like if you don't have the cake, if you don't have the capabilities that you're going to put into the marketplace or the dev portal, you're going to have a dev portal that no one actually comes to. And that's a real problem that I'm seeing quite regularly now. People coming to us saying, we've built this dev portal, it looks great, no one's coming to it, can you come and help get people using it? And when you look at what they're actually trying to put into it, they haven't thought about their customers as, um, uh, uh, their, their devs as customers, they haven't thought about it as products with value streams and actually what are you trying to do in, in a business um, and actually they've just kind of got this piece of tech and they've dumped it in there so I think I think there's a lot of opportunity there they um, can, cannot be just empty shell they need to yeah and it comes back to what we were talking about earlier yeah. in the earlier panel about AI as well I, I, I think I think it's a, you need a certain level of maturity or understanding if you're going to get the most out of bringing this into your organization otherwise it's likely going to distract you talking about hypes one more short one to anybody uh, do you think cloud migration is just hype trend in cases where we are migrating on-prem big data systems because the cost, process, monitor, etc. are high? So is this hype going down anytime soon or...? I, I mean, I, I, I sort of mentioned that you know, we, we do a lot of lift and shift and we have some, some products, uh, also some, some, some teams who help other teams move their stuff from off of T-Systems into the cloud, um, but that's not really Cloudification, yeah. So that's just lift and shift, and then it's just running on, a, on another computer. Yeah. Um, so I think if you want to do cloudification right, you need to not just lift and shift, but really figure out how to use those services. Yeah. So ahead of us is thinking, like Sarah said uh, yesterday, uh, nobody is ta taking our thinking away. No yep. technology can change that. Exactly. So we will need to think and make the decisions. Yep. So the last one for everybody, not anybody, but I really would like uh, uh, each of you to answer it quickly. As a platform engineering gains acceptance and mature over the next couple of years, what are the future challenges facing central platform teams? Who wants to go first? Uh, I can try, and Great. I will come back to, to something that was already okay, mentioned. Cool. Uh, Hypercentralization, let's call it like that. So the, the, it, the challenge is not to, uh, not to try to put everything centrally and not to go into a trap that you, when you build one platform, it will serve the whole company, the whole group. When you build one set of, I don't know, API, APIs, they need to be used by the whole, whole group. Whole it doesn't work that way. So you need to build smart and you need to build for the environment you are, you are in. And this is the, it happened before and I'm sure it will happen, uh, happen again. And this is the biggest trap for, from my perspective. Great. You do hyper centralization and you say, okay, this is the standard, this is the platform Must. you all need to yeah. use, and now we are just going around with the stick and seeing who's not using it. Mm -hmm. Great, great, great answer. I'll add on to that. Um, I think if you can think about platform engineering services like any other microservice that might be in your ecosystem, that the, the shift to microservice was to create sort of smaller, more replaceable. Uh, components, uh, so over time you can kind of throw those ones away and kind of refactor and, and, and reshape some things. I think if, if your platform is becoming too big to fail and it's getting uh, sucked in by everything, uh, you're, you're in danger of that now slowing your, your, your industry down, slowing your company down. Um, so a couple of things to think about is how can I be more nimble? How can these um, services be more composable, easily thrown, maybe not easily thrown away because we're talking about the foundations of your, uh, of, of your um, technology business, but uh, a little bit more composable, a little bit more replaceable. And, and again, just think about it like a whole bunch of other services that you might have that different teams are, are, are depending on, I think will help. Yeah, just to, to add what the guys said already, uh, some of the earlier organizational concepts have failed because people in these kinds of groups were perceived as some kind of ivory tower, uh, you know, the special group of people in the organization who get to do cool things. 
we need to make sure that the, the rest of the organization, people in, in, in other teams as well, uh, somehow take part in, in uh, building the platform, get to vote uh, somehow for, for the things that get chosen, and communicate their experiences. They need to be uh, perceived and they need to feel like they're a part of this platform. Not like the external body yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Yeah, again, it, it boils down to making sure that you know what your customer wants and not losing that focus. But if you get bigger and bigger and bigger, you start to sort of think, well, well, we'll tell them what they want, sort of. And you need to make sure that you don't fall into that trap. As well as, if you, the longer you run a platform, um, the, this an interesting discussion we had in, in, in our DevRox Expert Council is, when does software become legacy software? So what, what, what is the point? When, how do you measure that? How do you know, as okay, now it's, it's written, legacy? Isn't that what they say? Hmm? As sorry? soon as it's written? Sorry, it's, as so, soon as it's yeah, written. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it, it, sooner or later, it will become yeah, a legacy. And then you need to, as you said, you need to constantly reinvent it, sort of, and, and throw away old parts and put in new parts to make sure you're still up to, you know, up to date with all, all the stuff you need uh, to make sure that you're still serving your customers properly and have all the new technologies in, because that will change. And if you don't do that constantly, then yeah, you'll die out. So basically, from your answers, nobody said, well, there is no future for platform engineering. <laughs> so we can bet that it will, it's not a hype. It is here to stay. And so I think we are now up to Luca. Thank you. You were great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, are, you are free to go. You're excused. And, uh, you can take your time, Max. <laughs> <laughs>